I invite you to bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, as we begin now this story, we pray that you will um, come down, manifest yourself to us, speak through me to the hearts of everyone here, myself included. Father, we pray that this message will be to the glory of God and not the glory of man. We pray, Lord, that decisions will be made for eternity, that hearts may be wooed through the preaching of the gospel and the telling of a sinner's story. Please, Lord, be with us now as we spend this time learning and studying and listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. My name is David Ashrick. I have been speaking night by night at the Hope for the Homeland Bible Prophecy Seminar meetings at Godwin Heights High School Auditorium. How many of you have been there at least one time? Good. How many of you have been there at least two times? Good. How many of you have been there every night? Oh, good. There are a few of you. Praise the Lord. Good, good, good. Well, some of you have probably been coming to the afternoon meetings to to uh, hear Pastor Glenn preach. How many of you have been coming to those, the afternoon meetings? Oh, good. Excellent. Excellent. Glad to see that. And back in the corner. Good to see that. Well, I invite you to turn your Bibles just momentarily this morning to John, the Gospel of John. John chapter 12. And this morning I have the decided privilege of telling what God has done in my life and how He did it. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, and notice with me verse 32 of John 12. The Bible says this. Jesus speaking, He says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw how many men to me? All men to me. Jesus here makes the categoric statement that if He is lifted up in praise, And if he is lifted up on the cross, that everybody will be drawn to him. God has a very difficult problem. And I think that those of us who have children can be very sympathetic to God's problem. God is trying to get the attention of a world that is bent on not paying attention. God is trying to arrest the attention of a planet who is constantly putting other things in the way to detract their attention. And Jesus here says God will have a universal, perfectly efficient attention-getting device. And when this device has been instituted, everybody will be drawn to this device. Well, what is that device? It is the cross of Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. The picture here is one of people who are wandering after other things, who have their attention focused on something else. But when they see Christ high and lifted up, their attention is drawn away from what had formerly occupied it to something new. And this new thing that arrests the attention of every man, woman, and child, according to Jesus, is Christ lifted up. The Apostle Paul said the exact same thing. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we'll actually notice a couple verses in chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and then we'll look quickly at a verse in chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says in verse 18, the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The Apostle Paul believed that it was the cross. It was the cross alone that had the power and the efficacy to save. It was the cross alone that could arrest the attention of every man and woman. Notice what he goes on to say about the cross in verse 22. For the Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. Verse 23, but what is Paul's response to this? 
But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The apostle says, I am faced with a problem. The vast majority of the people to whom I am witnessing to are either Jews, that is the literal descendants of Abraham, and when they think of the cross, it is to them a stumbling block. He says the other group that I have to minister to are the Greeks, or the word can be translated Gentiles. In many instances, these Gentiles have their own religion, their own religious ceremonies, rites, and rituals. And in the instance of the Greeks in particular, they were very intelligent. In Acts chapter 17, we are introduced to a story in which the Apostle Paul is in the very seat of Hellenistic culture. He's in the city of Athens. And he is preaching the resurrection of Jesus. And some people hear him preaching the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And they've never heard anything like this before. So they they take Paul. They say, Paul, you come with us. We're going to take you to a place called Mars Hill. And there in Acts chapter 17, Paul stands on Mars Hill in front of a group called the Areopagus. This was the elite of the elite. These were the smartest men in all, probably, of ancient time. And Paul stands before them and begins to preach Christ. He preaches Christ crucified, and he preaches Christ resurrected. Paul's problem was that he needed to arrest the attention of the people away from their own pursuits, away from their own ideas, away from their own various religious philosophies and opinions and arrest their attention onto a single figure who alone could save them. How would he do it? The answer is simple. He would preach Christ. He would preach Christ crucified. The smart people would say it's foolishness. The Jews would say it's a stumbling block. But he preached Christ. And that's why he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, And verse 2, notice this incredible verse, 1 Corinthians 2, 2. He says, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. When it came time for the Apostle Paul to preach, he knew that there was one subject alone that could arrest the attention of mankind. He knew that there was one subject alone that could draw the attention of man and woman away from their own pursuits to the thing that God was trying to draw them to. Jesus and Paul agreed perfectly. Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me, smart men and not so smart men, black men and white men, young men and older men, all men would be drawn to Jesus. The Apostle Paul grabbed hold on this simple axiomatic truth and he said that's the reason when I go into any town, any city, any country, any area, I have one doctrine that I preach. Everything else that I preach emanates from this epicenter and that one doctrine, that epicenter was Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, the divine Son of Man and Him crucified. People that run advertising campaigns spend thousands of hours, thousands of dollars, much energy and much resources to try and determine how best to arrest the attention of the public. Particularly here in the United States of America, we are literally inundated with the efforts of various advertising agencies to attract our attention to the new car to attract our attention to a new brand of cigarettes, to attract our attention to a new breakfast cereal, thank you, to attract our attention to any number of things that can be purchased in our consumer-driven society, and companies will hire advertising agencies to the tune of millions of dollars, billions of dollars probably in some instances, simply to attract the attention of you and I. It must work. 
because the advertising agency and the advertising industry continues to grow at an alarming rate. We drive down the highway, we see billboards everywhere. If you own a cathode ray emitter, better known as a television, you know that between your various programs that you enjoy watching, there is, there is scores of commercials. If you're internet savvy and you get on the internet, everybody is flashing up their banner, trying to get before my eyes and before your eyes something that will grab our attention, something that will be clever, something that will be smart enough to cause us to not consider what we were thinking about and to begin to think about, I really do need that new car. I really do need a new Apple computer. I really do need to wear that kind of cologne. God, though, is not investing billions in various advertising campaigns. God is not investing millions in billboards and radio advertisements and, and other things. God has a single plan. God has a single mechanism that He uses to arrest the attention of mankind. And that is Christ on the cross. If we will not be attracted by that, we will not be attracted. If we won't be drawn to that, we will not be drawn. There is no plan B. God's plan A, He has invested all of the resources of heaven, all of the resources of the universe into this one plan. There is one plan, one way, and the entire PR campaign, the advertisement campaign for the plan of salvation is Jesus Christ hanging on a cross. We are driving down the highway of life. And Satan has a thousand things to grab our attention. Literally thousands of things. Some of the more popular things that arrest our attention are probably things like relationships with the opposite sex. There will probably be more people in the fires of hell because they chose another man or another woman in an ungodly relationship rather than Jesus than any other single reason that people won't be in the kingdom. So the devil has the, the attraction of intimacy. And many people have fallen hook, line, and sinker for that. Have you ever met a fine young Christian man or woman who says, I know he's not a Christian, but he's so nice to me. I know he's not a Christian, but I'm in love. You ever heard that before? Makes me want to vomit. People don't have the intelligence to consider that marrying somebody outside of the faith will probably ruin their life. Now, God is merciful, and in all instances that does not transpire. But the devil has this attraction, intimacy, relationships. And we are bombarded with, with half-naked ladies on billboards and half-naked men trying to arouse the sensual passions in our hardened heart. The devil has another distraction, though, and that is the distraction of money. If there is a close runner-up to the attraction of the lust of the flesh, it would probably be money. Even people who are not particularly wealthy can come, somehow become attracted to money. Those people who have lots of money, at least my experience has been, that many times they are the people who see more clearly than anyone that money cannot satisfy the deepest longings of the heart. A dear friend of mine, not so many years ago, sold his business. He sold his business for almost half a billion dollars. He is a devoted Christian man. He will be the first to tell you that money cannot bring anything near the soul satisfaction that the Lord Jesus Christ can. But incredibly, there will be thousands and millions who will chase the God of money, the God of affluence, right into the grave. So the devil will lure us with that, won't he? Our career, a newer, better car, a nicer, bigger house, a larger, more prestigious sphere of influence in our job. And so many people 
have fallen hook, line, and sinker for the God of money, and they are racing as fast as they can for that pot of gold that seems always to elude. The devil has a thousand distractions. Even our own carnal heart distracts us, tries to draw us away from that great arresting epicenter of power, the cross. If we choose to serve money and follow that over the cross, God has no plan B. If we choose to serve sensuality apart from the cross, God has no plan B. God's single plan, God's single advertisement for His great plan of salvation is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Every single person has a testimony. Amen? Every person in this room has a testimony. If you've come to Jesus, you have a testimony. And I used to think that testimonies were essentially different. I've come now to the conclusion that testimonies are essentially the same. Every one of you could get up here and give your testimony and it would be equally valid with David Asherick's testimony. Can you say amen? Nobody has a better testimony. Nobody has a worse testimony. Now, due to our own way that we evaluate things in, in this exciting, television-oriented culture, we say that some people have a better testimony. But the reality is, is nobody has a better testimony than anybody else. If you have come to Jesus and you have found yourself at the foot of the cross, you have the best testimony. Can you say amen? Yeah. Some people are raised in the church and they never go outside of the church. My wife has that testimony and it's a great one. She never had to go out and sow her proverbial wild oats. She just stayed with Jesus for most of her life. And that's a great testimony, isn't it? I love it. Other people have different testimonies. Today, let me share with you mine. All of our testimonies are basically identical. How is it that God brought us into that experience where we were caused to evaluate what I am pursuing what has my attention now and the cross of Christ. Every one of us was brought into that situation where we had to put on the right side my desires, my goals, my ambitions, my plans, my distractions and the cross of Christ. And these two things were weighed in the balance. And in that moment, in that crucible of time, God gave us an extra measure of His Spirit. And in that second, much to the chagrin of Satan and much to the amazement of all of the evil angels of hell, we chose the cross. Every one of us is in the process of either being attracted by Jesus or distracted by the world. We are either attracted by Christ or we are distracted by our own carnal heart. Before I tell you my story, let's look at one more quick scripture. And this one's in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 15. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. The Bible says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. Hmm. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You see the contrast. Love for the Father or love for the world. They are mutually exclusive. Jesus said you can't have both. You can't have two masters. You'll love the one and hate the other, or you'll cling to the one and despise the other. Can't do it. He then says in verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, that would be sensuality, the lust of the eyes, that would be anything that causes us to be distracted from the plan that God has for us. Things like money. And the pride of life. The pride of life is really insidious. Because we are basically prideful in two things. We are prideful in what we think about ourselves and we are prideful in what we perceive that others think about us. Isn't that true? Our pride is heightened when we think we're somebody. 
And our pride is heightened even more when we think that somebody else thinks we're somebody. And we will expend a lot of energy to get other people to think that we're something that we're really not. And if we ever are exposed for what we really are, poor, wretched, miserable, blind, naked sinners, it deals a devastating blow to our pride. Verse 17, And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. In this verse of Scripture, there are two things that are brought into contradistinction, contrast. The will of God and the love of the world. The will of God and the love of the world. You could put it this way. The will of God and the world of gold. The will of God versus the world of gold. The world of gold will pass away, but the will of God abides forever. I have never met my biological father. Interestingly, I was not born David Asherick. I was born with a last name that I almost wish I still had. I was born David Charles Cross, C-R-O-S-S, -S, just like the cross of Christ. That was my birth name. My original father, my biological father, decided that it was not in his best interest at the young age of 18 to stay around and raise a child. It was cramping his style. And like so many other men of today who are able to go through the physiological process of fathering a child, but unwilling to go through the motions of raising a child, my father left my mother three months after I was born. I've never yet met him. I did call him on a phone one time about two years ago. I said, hello, is Frank Cross there? He said, this is Frank. I said, how are you doing, Frank? My name is David Charles Asherick. He knew that I had been adopted and he recognized the name immediately and he just began to say over and over again, Oh my God. Oh my God. Well, when he finally settled down enough, it has been probably about 26 years since he had seen me, I said, uh, I'm in town. I was in the town he was in. Could we get lunch? I'd like to meet you. I was a Christian. I wanted to know if he was. I wanted to introduce him to Jesus. And his response was a microcosm of his response to my mother 26 years before. He said, you know, right now I'm real busy. And so we couldn't get together. My mother remarried two years later a man by the name of Glenn. Glenn treated my mother well at first. My mother was not a Christian particularly, neither was her newfound husband. And after about a year, characteristics in Glenn's life began to come out that were not formerly evident, an anger and a temper that she had not seen before. And when he would get real mad and correspondingly real drunk, he would beat my mother. Bad. Now, I was young, two and a half years old. And I was not his child. I was somebody else's child. And so I too would feel the wrath of my father and be beaten. I don't remember it, for which I am thankful. After about a year of this, my mother gave birth to a son with this second husband. His name was Robert. That was the only good thing that came out of that experience. My mother was with this man for eight years. And while she would be beaten routinely, and I would be as well, he would never lay a finger on his own son. Quite fascinating. At the young age of nine years old, my mother divorced this man. I had really not known anybody yet as a father. And two years later, my mother remarried, this time an officer in the United States Air Force. And I can tell you that he was an officer and a gentleman. He was the first man that ever treated my mother the way that she deserved to be treated. And at the age of 12 years old, I called my new dad into my room. My name was still David Charles 
Dormany, because I'd been adopted. And I'd gotten to know this fella for about the course of a year, and I, I called him into my room, and I said, Dad, that's what I called him. I said, Dad, I want to change my name to your name. I don't like this old name. Never seen this guy since he left my mother. I want your name. There's a spiritual lesson in that. When we come to God who treats us right, we want His name. And my father began to cry. He was not going to put the pressure on me or my younger brother to be adopted, but we both made the decision to change our last name from Dormany to Asherick. And that is the name I've worn since the age of 12 years old. And I'm proud of it. It's a good name. I'm proud of it not so much because of what it means in terms of its ethnicity, but because it reminds me of my father who treated my mother well, who took two children into his home that he didn't know and hadn't reared, and he treated us like we were his own. He is a good man. Well, when my father and mother married now, my mother's third husband, my dad was a Catholic. My mother was a nominal Protestant. And they did the logical thing. They became Episcopalians. <laughs> Episcopalians just about as close as you can get to Rome without actually being in Rome. And my dad brought with him two children as well. A brother, now my brother, his son, and a sister. They're both older. Interestingly, both of my brothers are named Robert. I have Robert Wayne, who is older, and Robert Oakley, who is younger. I have two sisters and two brothers. Quite fascinating. Well, my dad, new dad, he really wanted to win my favor and my brother's favor. And you know that must be a very difficult circumstance to come into. Some of you might know this experience of which I'm speaking. You marry into a situation where you are now in a position to raise a child that was not yours. And in this instance, where the first dad and the second dad have, have totally passed off the scene, now the full weight of responsibility rests upon you to raise this child as though it was your own. And I want to say that is not an easy experience. And any man who has the courage to do that is a man that should be commended. And he wanted to win my approbation and my brothers. He wanted us to think he was cool, right? And so he took my brother and I to Kmart cool place to go. And as we walked into the door of Kmart, he said to my brother and I, he said, boys, today is your lucky day. I'm going to take you shopping. I have some things I need to pick up in the automotive department. I was 12. My brother was nine. He said, I'm going to buy each of you anything you want in this store up to $50. Now, when you're 12 years old and your dad takes you to Kmart, and he tells you that he's going to buy you anything you want up to $50, you feel like you can purchase almost the entire store. He said, you've got 15 minutes. You run off and I'll meet you here at the cash register in about 15 minutes. Go find what you need. It cannot be over $50 each. Now, we immediately thought this guy was cool. Are you with me? So where do you think we went? What section do you think we went to? The toy section. Where else would you go, right? The toy section. And we're kind of walking through the aisles and I can still see that Kmart store in my mind's eye. I'm looking this direction and looking this direction and just, you know, making calculations in my little adolescent mind there, trying to decide, you know, which, which would be the best way to expend this voluminous amount of money that I have. And as we were coming through the toy section, sort of weaving our way through, there is a place in most department stores where the toy section kind of meets the sporting goods section. And as we came around the corner there, we, we saw a large pyramid display. It was probably not as tall as I remember it, but it seemed like it was a pyramid itself. And uh, that display, as I saw it, contained exactly what I wanted. And I walked up and I looked at the price tag and it was $49.95. It was a sign from God. And I walked over to that pyramid display and I picked up something that looks just like this. A skateboard. 
And as I grabbed that skateboard, my nine-year-old brother was right behind me and he too went over and picked up the skateboard that looked most attractive to him and we ran to the front of the Kmart store and we said, Dad, we found what we want. And my new father, for just about a millisecond, looked at us and almost said no. He said, mm. all right, come on. He took us through the checkout counter, $49.95. He covered the tax. And my brother and I went out just like this, hugging our brand new skateboards. Now, when I got home, my mother was not happy. How dare you buy one of those devices that is going to utterly injure and cripple my dear children? You don't care about them. But after a little while, my mother finally gave in. And I can remember that at this time, there was a family reunion going on there in my uh, uh, grandmother's house. We were all gathered together. And uh, my first day on my skateboard, I couldn't stand on it. Not on the cement, at least. I could stand on it on the, on the carpet. And so I would just stand in the living room like this. <laughs> just like, and I'd tip back, and I'd tip back down. I was afraid to go out on the cement because I tried it once and it rolled right out and I got a big scrape on my elbow and so I would just stand like this on the carpet. And then I got, you know, wanting to learn some tricks and so I learned a trick in which I could pop the skateboard up into my hand. Just like that. Do you see that? I did it thousands of times. Just like that. I'd say, hey mom, watch this. <laughs> now I couldn't yet roll... I couldn't jump, no such thing. I could just pop it up into my hand and sometimes I'd even do it without looking. I'd say, hey mom, watch this, I'm not looking. <laughs> well, after a little while, that no longer could satisfy and I got the, the, the guts and the courage to go out on the cement. And I was rolling down my grandmother's driveway, always rolling toward the grass so that I could jump off in an emergency situation. Now, how many of you have ever actually ridden a skateboard before? Good. It's not as easy as it looks. In my experience, I have had many people come up to me and say, Oh, a skateboard. Usually these are 30 or 40 year old men going through a midlife crisis. <laughs> wanting to demonstrate to their onlooking spouse and or child that they are not yet over the hill. And they say, Let me try that. And I have put not me, but my skateboard has put not less than a dozen men flat on their fannies trying to demonstrate that they are something they are not. It really is quite difficult. Well, at the age of 12, I began skateboarding. And by the time that I was 17, it was time to graduate from high school. I graduated at 17, a little younger than many. And I had made up my mind that I was going to become a professional skateboarder. Now, I hadn't let my dad know that yet. The reason for that is, is that my father is very, very in favor of education. Anybody else here have a parent like that? And when everybody else was going off to college, I sat my father down, who spent 32 years in the military, so that gives you a feel for his personality. And he was the vice president of a university when he retired for about 14 years. And so you can just imagine how he feels about education. I was 17 years old. I said, Dad, I need to talk to you. Well, what's it about, son? I said, well, Dad, you know that um, graduation's coming up. Most of my friends are going to South Dakota State University or USD, the University of South Dakota. But I've been thinking about my future, Dad. Yes, son. And you know, Dad, I'm pretty good on a skateboard. And he knew where this was headed. And in the course of that conversation, I let my dad know, much to his chagrin, that I was opting not to go to South Dakota State University, but choosing rather to go to San Diego, California, and become a professional skateboarder. And he said, that's great, son. Is that, was his, is that what he said? <laughs> That would have been a miracle if there ever was one. He did everything that he could to dissuade me, but I was undissuaded. And much to my father's chagrin and much to my mother's chagrin, I turned down a scholarship to go to South Dakota State University and chose instead 
to move to San Diego, California at the young age of 18 to pursue my dream of becoming a professional skateboarder. Sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? Be honest. Well, I think that that's kind of the point. I was 18 years old. I didn't know Jesus. I'd never been exposed to the claims of Jesus. Sure, I knew that there was a Jesus. And I'd heard people say that Jesus saves. I had occasionally gone to church with my parents. But as far as any real knowledge of the Bible or of Christ, nothing. And so in this time, I was just pursuing my own desires, my own goals, my own ambitions. And the chiefest ambition that I had was to be a professional skateboarder. Well, after about five or six years of skateboarding, I was pretty good. I could actually roll down the sidewalk. And I wouldn't have moved out there to San Diego if I wouldn't have thought that there was a very real possibility that I could do what I set out to do. We had seen the videos and we'd seen the magazines. And I became increasingly convinced that I was skateboarding at a level of proficiency that was just about the same as the professionals were. And so we moved out there to San Diego, California, the mecca of the skateboarding world. When we arrived, I had two friends with me. And uh, we were pretty good, actually. Comparatively, we were quite good. And we were kind of a novelty amongst the people there in San Diego. Anybody here from California? Good, a couple of you. My experience with Californians is that they act as though there is no other place outside of California. They just are unaware that anything exists beyond the Sierras. And so we would encounter some very unusual circumstances. People would say to me, so where are you from? Well, I'm from South Dakota. And they'd say, is that near Bakersfield? <laughs> On one occasion, I told somebody I was from South Dakota, and they said, that's where the Indians are at, right? Do you still have to worry about that? That's what he asked me, no joke. Do they still live in teepees? Do you have paved roads? I mean, these people, they think that we are just a bunch of Neanderthals east of the Sierras. Well, we were a novelty because we were from corn country, South Dakota. And we were a bunch of hillbillies, farmers, country boys, as it were. And we were good on a skateboard. And it wasn't too long before we were approached by various manufacturers of boards and wheels and trucks. That's the thing that holds the wheel to the board. And uh, t-shirts, and clothes, and shoes, who just offered to give us some free stuff. Thinking that if we rode their board and skateboarded well, that the others who saw us riding would want the same kind of board that we had. And so it was an advertising campaign. The kids today call this being sponsored. Somebody gives you free stuff. Here's a free skateboard. You ride my skateboard. I'll give you ten of them. Here's a shirt. How about twenty of them? Give a few out and wear some yourself. Every time you go out skateboarding. And then photographers began to call us. Say, hey, what are you doing on Wednesday? Can we go on a photo shoot? And, and videographers begin to call us and say, what are you doing on Thursday? Can we go on a video shoot? Wanting to film us and take pictures of us. And, and what was happening was is that my dream, the fondest dream of this little 18-year-old heart was coming true before my very eyes. Have you ever had your lifelong dream come true? Henry David Thoreau often commented or commented at least on one occasion, he said, most men lead lives of quiet desperation. I think he means by that that most people don't actually achieve what they want to achieve. They wish they could. Most basketball players don't get to be as good as Michael Jordan. Most of them don't make it into the pros. But people have goals. They have dreams. They have desires. They have visions and and, and plans, things that they want to do, that they believe will, will cause them to, to find true satisfaction. And in my experience, I was a, an 18-year-old boy, and the dream that I had harbored in my breast for six years was coming true before my eyes. People giving me free skateboards, entering into skateboard contests and winning, having people offer me free 
clothes and pants and shoes, all that I wanted, really, if I would just ride their certain brand. I was 19 years old. I had broken my right ankle twice. And I realized in the loneliness of Southern California that even though my dream was coming true right in front of me, that there was an emptiness in my heart and in my soul that I could not account for. It was very confusing. After all, why should you achieve the very thing that you want to achieve only to feel empty? That doesn't make sense to a 19-year-old. And I was frustrated, and I was angry, and I was upset. And after I broke my ankle the second time, I moved back to South Dakota. I was almost 20 years old. I had lived the cutting-edge skateboard life for the better part of a year. And I decided that, it, decided that it was time to retire from the extreme sport. That, that term had not yet been coined, extreme sport of skateboarding. When I got home, my father was just waiting on the steps. And I think almost the first words out of his mouth before he said, hello even, was, are you ready to go to college? Now, my dad's a good dad, but let me tell you what he bought me for my, my graduation present. You got a guess? Luggage. See, he was a military dad. And when you were 18, you were out. And when I moved back in, my very gracious, militaristic father started charging rent. No joke. And if I didn't pay on time, it was trouble. Interest. He's a good dad, but he's, he's no, he does not mess around. Well, my dad was so happy to have me back home. And I was happy to be home, to be honest. Southern California was difficult for me. Uh, we lived in a neighborhood where there were shootings and gangs, and we got into a couple very difficult circumstances, and only probably by the angels of heaven, if I could look back, did we get out of those circumstances. We were naive. We were 18-year-old kids, and we'd go skateboarding in the worst areas of town. A bunch of white kids driving reasonably nice cars, skateboarding where the best places were. Now, we didn't pay any attention to the fact that the socioeconomic group in which we were skateboarding was not one that was uh, particularly conducive to doing the things that we were doing, and we'd get harassed. But we were just too dumb to stop. And we got into some circumstances, beloved, where God Himself delivered us. It was scary. Be at night. Whew. Well, I come back home and my dad wants to keep me home. And about this time, I have a friend that comes and knocks on my door. His name was Turi, Turi Lilligraven. And Turi Lilligraven came to my door and he said, David, uh, we are starting a band, a music band, and we want you to be a part of it. Now, I don't play any instruments. When I was, I think, in the third grade, my mother rented me a saxophone. And the saxophone teacher said, tomorrow you're going to get your saxophones. Don't put the mouthpiece on. Well, I got that thing home and I was just anxious to try and make it make noise. And so I configured this mouthpiece and put it together the best that I knew how and stuck it on there and um, was blowing, <laughs> trying to make it make noise. Well, when I got to class the next day, the saxophone teacher said, uh, uh, David, I told you not to put the mouthpiece on. I said, oh, uh, and I lied. I said, my next door neighbor is a, a professional saxophonist and he... Uh, <laughs> He uh, put that on for me, and she said, well, that's interesting, because he put it on upside down. <laughs> so I was caught. So I don't play an instrument, and when Turi comes to my door and says, hey, we, we want you to be in our band, my response is, I don't, I don't do anything in bands. What do you want me to do? What, what instrument do you want me to play? Or what, what do you want me to do in this band? And he said, we want you to play the bass. Now, a bass is like a guitar, but it has just four strings, which I thought would make it a little easier. And I asked him about that, and, and his response was just about this. David, you don't need to know how to play that instrument, because we're going to be a punk rock band. And he was right. So I went to my father, and I said, Dad, can you please give me your credit card? And he said, yes, he would. Now, that is not me, but that is close. That's not me either, but that's close. 
I went down to the local music store and bought a bass guitar and a bass amplifier, and I went to band practice. And we were terrible. I didn't know how to play this thing. But my friends put the guitar around me and gave me a pick, turned the volume up to 10. I held a note, a single fret note, and I just went like that. And then I learned that I was going to be the singer. <laughs> but that's okay because in punk rock bands you don't sing, you scream. So it was okay, I could do that. And so that's what I would do. You think I'm exaggerating? I'm not. I, that's all I knew to do. I just held that one fret and I just, and screamed, right? And then they did about the same thing. And we were terrible. But that's kind of the goal in punk rock. <laughs> it's to be bad, and we were bad. And to make a long story short, after about two years, we were getting better and better and better. And I thought to myself, it would be fun if we could do a tour. And we went on tour. It would be nice if we could release a CD. And we released several CDs. In fact, I find it very, very ironic that the largest show that I ever played in the punk rock world was in Detroit. And it was at a, it was at a festival called the Detroit More Than Music Festival and thousands of kids came to hear about 36 bands play over the course of a weekend and we were one of the featured bands and that's the city that I now pastor in. <laughs> but what was happening was is that my mind was going through a transition. And you've probably done something similar, though probably you've not toured around the country in punk rock bands. But what happens is, is that when one goal is either not attained or is attained and does not bring a happiness that is commensurate with the effort put into it, you begin to search for another distraction. It is tough for the human system, the human organism, to be idle. We, 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 we chafe against being idle. And so we want something that has our attention. And it became punk rock music. And I poured my heart into this for the better part of three years. But the incredible thing happened, even though the desire of my heart was to go on tours and we would play and people would come and clamor to visit with us and many of the bands that we used to play with now are the, are the top bands on MTV. I mean, incredible stuff. We were, we were living the dream. But the reality is, is that there was that same gnawing emptiness in my heart. Now, what do you do when you're 23 years old? And the very thing that you thought would bring happiness has failed to yield any happiness? What do you do when there's a gnawing sense of emptiness that something is missing, something important is missing? Well, you find another distraction. You find another distraction that will fill that void. It might have been Augustine that said we have a God-shaped void in our heart. A God-shaped void. It has a certain shape. And we take something else and we try to plug that God-shaped hole with something else, but it doesn't fit perfectly. There are spaces. There's an emptiness there. Some people take the alcohol bottle. They try to plug that God-shaped void, but there's an emptiness. Other people take money. They try to fill that God-shaped void with money, but there's an emptiness. There's, there's creases. There's holes around the edge. I didn't take money. Didn't really even take the relationship route. The distractions in my life were skateboarding. A piece of wood with urethane wheels and some metal trucks. This was the distraction. I poured probably ten years, the better part of ten years of my life into this piece of wood, and I was good at it. Still am. In fact, I just bought this skateboard about three days ago because I was not getting much exercise here preaching so much. And so I went down and I bought a skateboard and there's a local skateboard park here in town and I, I go over there right after I get done preaching for about an hour. I've got my tie on and I go in and, and they love it. You have to come over sometime. But anyway, it's fun. I can still skateboard with the best of them and I love it. In fact, I'm doing a demonstration this Wednesday at the Grand Rapids Junior Academy for the kids. The incredible thing is this. You find something that will attract your attention. For me, it was skateboarding. For me, it was music. 
And there were other distractions as well. They were not as large as these, but I got involved in rock climbing. And I was good at that too. When I was 23 years old, I took the American Mountain Guide Association certification course and I passed in my first year of climbing, which was basically unheard of. And my job was actually, for a while, a professional rock climbing guide. I took people up high mountains. Again, funny, those same men going through a midlife crisis. <laughs> that there is a picture of Devil's Tower. That was in my backyard, basically, and we would climb that 858 feet tall. I love to climb. Yet again, that emptiness remained. And then I found a girlfriend. And the emptiness remained. Nothing could fill that God-shaped void. Nothing could satisfy the deepest longings of the soul. All of it was a distraction. What's your distraction? My hunch is it's not skateboarding. My hunch is it's not punk rock music. But it could be an ungodly relationship. could be the all-powerful material God of money. What's your distraction? could be your family. What's your distraction? What is it that you are trying to shove into that God-shaped void? What is it? At the age of 24 years old, I was in my room crying. You know, 24-year-olds who have the world going for them really shouldn't be crying. I was enrolled at this point at the University of Wyoming. I was studying pre-medicine, 4.0 student. My father was very pleased. I had achieved my highest ambitions in the realm of skateboarding and come close in the realm of punk rock and had what I thought was a beautiful girlfriend. But I was crying. At the age of 24, that gnawing emptiness had caught up with me and it was crushing me out in my room. And I began to stare at my bookshelf. Most of those books I had read, most of them were college textbooks, anatomy, physiology, biochemistry. There were several books on there, though, that uh, I had not yet read, and one of them particularly grabbed my attention. It was a book that had been given to me about eight months before. At a restaurant, I've always been a vegetarian since I was 18. My wife has never eaten meat. She's been a vegetarian since the day she was born. But I was, I became a vegetarian because of health reasons. And a restaurant opened up in my town that was owned by some Christian folk. And I'd go in there and I had purple hair, blue hair, yellow hair, white hair, no hair, long hair, short hair, tattoos all over my body, rings in various places. And I would go in there looking for all the world like the devil himself, I think. Never seen him, but I can just imagine. And this lady treated me like I was just beaver cleaver. <laughs> she treated me so sweet. She was so kind. And I didn't look normal. I looked kind of weird. And I told her that I was a vegetarian and we had many discussions. And over the course of our brief friendship, she gave me a book. And I knew it was a Christian book and I had no interest in reading it. Not interested. That book had gone on my shelf. And here I was in my room, eight months later, staring at that book. And a little voice in my mind, I guess, said, pick that book up. Now, I had no Christian background in which to make sense out of this. And after quite a little bit of fight, I went and I got the book. And I picked it up. And I stared at it. It was a Christian book. Right on the front, it actually said Christ and Satan. The great controversy between Christ and Satan. 
And I uh, started to read it. And do you know what I was introduced to? A crying Jesus. The book opens in Luke chapter 19. And Jesus is crying. He's crying over Jerusalem. Why? Not because life had dealt him a sorry hand, but because the very people that he'd come to, to, come to save had rejected him. And as I began to read, I thought, hey, this fellow's a lot like me. He's crying. I'm crying. But I didn't have to read much further to find that he was crying for a very different reason than I was. And I don't know how many pages I read that first night. Probably close to 200. I just devoured it. At approximately 3 or 4 in the morning, I just could not keep my eyes open any longer and I fell to sleep. But before I went to sleep, I prayed a little and all I said is this. I said, God, if You're real, save me from myself because I'm afraid of what I'll become if you're not real. And I went to sleep. The next day I woke up and I can only say that the burden that was crushing me out in my room that day before and the many weeks before was gone. And I had a sense in my heart that there was a God who loved me. And I went to my Bible Actually, I had to go buy one at the university bookstore. I said, give me the most expensive one you got, and they did. <laughs> and I began to read that Bible. And I just devoured it. I read it for hours at a time, and, and I would read, and I saw there Jesus. A God who had all of the glories of the celestial kingdom who came down here forsaking everything for a sinner like me. And God used that thing, that one piece of advertisement, to draw my mind away from the things that had been distracting me. Away from skateboarding. Away from music. Away from rock climbing. Away from relationships. Away from academic uh, efficiency to draw my mind away from those things and I just was focused on the cross. The cross. Today God is trying to woo the world with the cross. In that moment, my whole life was on this side and in that moment the cross was on this side. And I felt as if the weight of the world would crush me out and I had to just choose between one or the other. Me or thee. And by the grace of God and that only, I chose Christ. And I take great consolation in the fact that Jesus said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. In closing, I invite you to go with me to Song of Solomon, chapter 3. Song of Solomon is found after the Psalms, after the Proverbs, after Ecclesiastes. Song of Solomon, chapter 3. Having chased a thousand distractions, I finally came face to face with the one supreme attraction. Does somebody here have the King James Version? Anybody have the King James? Somebody have one I could see real quick. It's better in the King James. This verse is incredible in the King James. Song of Solomon chapter 3 and verse 1. By night on my bed I sought Him whom my soul loveth. I sought Him, but I found Him not. Verse 2, I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the broadways. I will seek Him whom my soul loveth. I sought Him, but I found Him not. Verse 3, the watchmen that go about the city found Me, to whom I said, Saw ye Him whom my soul loveth? Verse 4, it was but a little that I passed from them but I found Him whom my soul loveth, and I held Him, and I would not let Him go. Beloved, have you found Him whom your soul loveth? 
Have you found Him who alone can make sense and beauty out of life? Have you found Him whom your soul loves? Are you chasing a thousand distractions, a thousand, a thousand advertisements that Satan has thrown in your way, or will you today surrender to that great epicenter of power, the cross? I speak to you today as a man who is experienced. And I tell you that whatever it is that you are searching for, whatever it is, whether it is base and disgusting or noble and lofty, whatever you are searching for today, whatever you are filling your life with today, if it is not Jesus Christ, you will be unhappy. You will be empty. And your life will never be what it could be if you accepted Him as your Savior. I'd like to invite you at this time to bow your heads with me and close your eyes as we make a solemn appeal to individuals in this room. Father in heaven, this is a time of appeal. You have communicated your story today through a simple instrument. Father, this is your story. The story of how you took a man who was chasing at breakneck speed after all of the ridiculous ridiculous distractions that this world has to offer and you stopped him, you arrested his attention with the cross of Jesus. And Father, I know that in a crowd this size there must be others here today who are seeking and searching after other things, other distractions. And Father, at this time you are calling you are calling people to Yourself. We claim the promise, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto Myself. Father, certainly here in this room today, there is a man, there is a woman who has not yet made the decision to surrender all to the great cross of Calvary. And those distractions are still bearing sway on the human heart. But Father, today You are calling men and women alike. Father, at this time we offer an appeal to every person in this room. Send Your angels here, Lord, to inspire the heart to make the right decision. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we make the appeal that if there is someone here today who wants to say, I have been following other distractions. But today I feel drawn by the supreme attraction of Christ on the cross, forsaking everything from me, the picture of selflessness, and me, the picture of selfishness. The Spirit of God has spoken to your heart today, and you want to say, Oh God, I come to you. Oh God, I come to You and accept this today anew. There is somebody here who has not yet made that decision and wants to make it now. I invite you to raise your hand. Raise your hand to heaven with every head bowed, every eye closed. God bless you, sister. God bless you, brother. Raise your hand to heaven. God bless you, sister. Is there another? God bless you. Is there yet another? God bless you, brother. Is there another who will make this decision? God bless you, sister. Is there another? God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. Is there another who will make this decision in the privacy of your own experience to seek the cross and that only? Is there another who will make this decision? Raise your hand to heaven. Amen. God bless you, sister. God bless you, brother. Is there yet another? Amen. God bless you, too. Is there yet another? The Lord is calling. Today the supreme attraction of the cross is wooing souls. Is there yet another who will raise their hand to heaven? God bless you. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for Jesus. Thank you for what he has done for us. For what he is to us. And for the matchless beauty of your Son. 
You have seen these hands raised to heaven and the angels have taken note. Father, I have taken note. And we pray that for those who could have raised their hands, who have not yet made that decision but didn't, we pray that you will give them no rest, no peace, until they come face to face with Christ on the cross. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness, kindness, mercy, and love. And thank you for saving me, chief of sinners though I be. Jesus shed his blood for me. We ask all these things, thanking you, praising you, and giving you all of the honor and the glory. Amen. This media was produced by Hope Media Ministry. For this and other great witnessing material, please visit our website at www.hopevideo.com. Our address is Hope Media Ministry, P.O. Box 752, Ada, Michigan, 49301. You can also email us at hope at hopevideo.com. Our media includes DVD, video, CD audio, and cassette. You can also listen to much of our media at our online media center for free at www.hopevideo.com. That's hopevideo.com. Thank you.